rather Adiamantus's concern, and he gives a very revealing image of what he takes justice to be, is with an image of self-guardianship or self-control. He tells us at 367a that each would be his own guard. In other words, we should not care what people say about us, but we should be prepared to develop qualities of self-containment, autonomy, and independence from the influence that others can exercise over us. How can I develop those qualities of self-guardianship or self-control, he asks Socrates. And who has not felt that way before? The two brothers desire to hear justice praised for itself, Glaucon, and to live freely and independently, Adiamantus. And that shows to some degree, I think, uh, their own sense of alienation from their own society. If I can put the case for them slightly uh, anachronistically, these are two sons uh, of the upper bourgeoisie who feel degraded by the mendacity and the hypocrisy of the world they see around them. In any way, what, what person with any sensitivity to greatness has not felt this way at one time or another? The two are open to persuasion, to consider alternatives, perhaps even radical alternatives, uh, to the society that has nurtured them. They are, to put it another way, perhaps, potential, not only potential rulers and potential philosophers, they may also be potential revolutionaries. And the remainder of the book is addressed to them and, of course, people like them. With the speeches of Glaucon and Adiamantus, you might say the circle around Socrates has effectively closed. He knows he will not be returning to Athens that evening. And he proposes instead, he proposes to the two brothers and those listening to the conversation a kind of thought experiment that he hopes will work magic on the two. Let us propose, he says, to watch a city coming into being in speech. Let us create a city in speech. It is easier, he says, to view justice uh, not to view justice microscopically in an individual, but rather let's view justice as it were through a magnifying glass. Let's view justice in the large sense. Let us view justice in a city in order to help us understand what it is in an individual. And this idea that the city is essentially analogous to the soul, that the city is, is like the soul, is the central metaphor around which the entire republic is constructed. It seems to be presented entirely innocuously. No one in the dialogue objects to it, yet everything else follows from this idea that the, that the city, the polis, is in certain essential respects like an individual, like the soul of an individual. What is Socrates trying to do here, and what is that metaphor, that central metaphor, in what function does it serve within the work? To state the obvious, uh, Socrates introduces this analogy to help the brothers better understand what justice is for an individual soul. The governance of the soul, Adiamantus' standard of self-control, uh, must be like the governance of a city in some decisive respects. But in what respects? How is a city like a soul? And in what respect is self-governance, the control of one's passions and appetites, in what respect is self-control like the governance of a collective body? Consider the following example. When we say that so-and-so is typically American, or typically, to take Taiwanese, for example. We mean that that person expresses certain traits of character and behavior that are broadly representative, in some way, of the cross-section of their countrymen. Is, that, is this a useful way to think? 
Uh, more specifically, what does it mean to say that an individual can be seen as magnified in his or her country, or that one's country is simply the collective expression of certain individual traits of character? That seems to be what Socrates is suggesting, right? Is that what he's, he's getting at? One way of thinking about the metaphor of city and soul together is to think of it as a particular kind of causal hypothesis uh, about the formation of both individual character and political institutions. In this reading of the city-soul analogy as a kind of causal relation uh, maintains the view that, in, that as individuals we both shape and determine the character of our societies and that those societies in turn shape and determine individual character. The city and soul analogy could be seen then as an attempt to understand how societies reproduce themselves and how they shape citizens who again in turn shape the societies in which they uh, inhabit. That seems to be one way of making sense of the city soul uh, hypothesis, but in, again, it doesn't seem to answer the question in what way are cities and individuals alike? To take the American case, for example, uh, does it mean that something like uh, the presidency, the Congress, and, this, and the court uh, can be uh, discerned within the soul of every American citizen? I mean, that would be absurd uh, to think that, obviously. I mean, I think it would be absurd. Uh, maybe, maybe you want to argue it and we could have a discussion. But uh, it might mean that uh, American democracy or democracy of any kind uh, helps to produce a particular kind of democratic soul. Uh, just like, you might say, the old regime in France, the old aristocratic society existing before the revolution tended to produce a very different kind of soul, a very different kind of individual. Every regime will produce a distinctive kind of individual, and this individual will come to embody the dominant, the dominant character traits of the particular regime. The remainder of the republic is again devoted to crafting a regime that will produce a distinctive kind of human character. And that, of course, is why the book uh, is a utopia. There has never been a regime in history that was so single-mindedly devoted to the end of producing that rarest and most difficult species of humanity called simply philosopher. So, city and soul. 